The Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. That whistle is your signal for the Signal Oil Program, The Whistler. And I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales, hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Yes, friends, it's time for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler. Rated by Independent Research, the most popular West Coast program in radio history. In gasoline, you know, it takes extra quality to give you extra mileage. And Signal is the famous go-farther gasoline. So look for the Signal circle sign in yellow and black that identifies friendly dealer-owned Signal service stations from Canada to Mexico. And now the Whistler's strange story, The Black Book. Paul had looked forward to the opening night in Philadelphia for months. And if anything, it had exceeded his brightest hopes. In a way, it was a reward for the four long years of struggle since he'd come to Cecil Wenham's Ballet Arts Company as an unknown dancer from London. Yes, Philadelphia was a wonderful opening with five curtain calls for him alone after Spectre of the Road. He knew he had America in the palm of his hand now, that the morning papers would hail him as a star, that he was no longer a promising newcomer, but a great dancer. So it was ironic on that night in Philadelphia, with the applause still ringing in his ears, that Cecil Wenham should come into Paul's room and shatter his dream into a thousand bits. Paul. Hello, Cecil. Paul, I've done it. I've signed her up. You'd better tell me tomorrow. I'm dining with some friends. A three-year contract exclusive with options on two more. Look, Cecil. Now, I want you to meet her, Paul. She's up in my office now. All right. Who is it, Cecil? Of course, I couldn't tell you her name until now, but... Paul, we've got the greatest choreographer and ballet mistress in the business. I had a hard time persuading her to leave London. Wait a minute. London? Oh, she's been topped over there for years. Who is it, Cecil? Tell me. Catherine Valadon. Catherine Valadon. You... You hired Valadon. You, you know her? But she doesn't dance. Well, I, I'm buying her head, not her feet. She'll direct the company for us. She's she's out there now? Yes, come on. I, I said want... I was late, Cecil. Oh, come on. Did you oh. hear me? I'm late. I don't want to talk to anybody. Now, please, leave me alone. Yes, it's ironic, isn't it, Paul? This night of triumph, the great performance, the resounding applause suddenly becomes meaningless. And there's a heavy feeling of defeat inside you as you sink into the sofa in your dressing room, alone now. You sit there thinking, half hearing the music of the finale, and in your mind it seems to change slowly and strangely into another melody on a rehearsal piano four years ago in a London theater. A couple moves down stage center, the young man steps to one side as the woman comes to a point in front of him. The man is you, Paul, and the woman, Catherine Valadon. No! 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 Stop it! We're all off! Do your mind, Paul. I'd like to get it right just this once. What's the matter now? You are supposed to lift me at that passage. I know it. Then why did you stand there like an oaf? You are at least two beats behind me. I was following the music. That's more than I can say for you. No! Oh, wait a moment now. Crawling won't get us anywhere. What's the trouble, Catherine? I am waiting for Paul to decide to become a dancer. Perhaps you can convince him, Mr. Brady. I am ready to give up. I'll be in my dressing room if you need me. What's the idea, Paul? She's always waiting for me to slip so she can pounce her. You had no right to talk to her like that. The timing was off and you know it. No wonder it's off. I told you I can't dance with her. She's a she's a machine, not a woman. Listen to me, Paul. 
I'm not going to let that phony artistic temperament of yours upset this company. You're going to her dressing room right now and apologize to her. I'll do nothing of the kind. You'll do it or leave the company. Look, Brady, that's pretty unreasonable of you. I'm dealing with an unreasonable man. Going to do as I say? Very well, Brady. Well, Paul? I've come to tell you that I'm sorry. How sweet of you. You can write that in your little black book, too. At exactly 3.15 and a half, on the afternoon of October 18th, Paul Cartmel came into your dressing room and apologized humbly. Did you come here to insult me again? You could be a charming woman if you weren't such a machine. Everything so... so prompt, precise, exact. It's my profession. It's your life. But you're not human, Catherine. Suppose you forget about me and concentrate on your own shortcomings. All right. All right, I'm sorry. Is he going on with the rehearsal? Of course. All right, let's try it again. And this time, keep your mind on your work. Yes, it's coming back to you, isn't it, Paul? How you walk back on the stage with her, humiliated, raging inside trying to ignore the embarrassed faces of the rest of the cast. The pianist picked up your cue, and the two of you moved together. She was poised before you on the point. And as you moved in to lift her, a single idea took hold of you. Yes, there's a traditional hazard in the ballet, Paul. A dancer dropped hard on a pointed toe will never dance again. you will lift her above you, higher and higher. Then, in a blind rage, you relax your hold. How is she, Doctor? I can't say yet. We're waiting for the x-rays. Is it... Uh, is it all right for me to go in? Oh, of course. Her friends are in there with her. Thank you. You're being a wonderful sport about it all, Kathy. <laughs> Why not? You don't think a little thing like a bruised toe... Oh. Hello, Catherine. Paul, what a lovely bouquet. I, uh, I hope you like them. I love them, darling. It's so thoughtful of you. Uh, Catherine, I, uh, I want to tell you how awful I feel. I... I don't know what happened. Oh, I... not another word now. Oh, it was an accident, Paul. Of course it was. Happens in the best of companies. And they've all told me I'll be as good as ever in a week or so. Now, uh, run along, you two. I want to talk to Paul. <laughs> sure enough. Keep it up, old girl. Goodbye, Kathy. Goodbye. See you tomorrow at one. Uh, one thirty, dear. Visiting hours, you know. Oh, good. Put me in the black book, darling. I'm so glad you're taking it this way, Catherine. I felt like such a heel. That's just it. You are a heel. What do you mean? Do you think I'm stupid, Paul? Do you think I'm blind? Accident. Everyone's talking about my unfortunate accident. Now, just a minute. You did not slip, Paul. I felt you let me go deliberately. And don't think I've swallowed that sugar-coated nonsense about coming out of it as good as ever. I'm through as a dancer. And I know it. Do you know what it's like to be through, Paul? Do you know how it feels to lie in a hospital bed with everything behind you? And nothing ahead? Well, you're going to know, Paul. I'm going to show you if it takes the rest of my life! And that's what brought you to America, Paul. You never admitted it, even to yourself. Told yourself it was the war. Gave yourself a thousand other reasons, but at the bottom of it was fear of a little black-eyed ballerina you knew would kill you if everything else failed her. Yes, Paul, Catherine Valadon has caught up with you at last. In spite of the new name, Paul Cooper, the new country, the new career... And as you lean back on the sofa in your dressing room, you know that here in Philadelphia, in a single evening, you've won and you've lost. Paul? Yes, Cecil? Oh, Mademoiselle Valadon, may I present our star, Paul Cooper? Don't get up. 
I didn't intend to. Well, well, Paul... Don't let it bother you, Mr. Venom. Paul and I are old friends. We've been through a lot together in London. Hadn't we, Paul? In those days, it was Paul Cartnell, though. For heaven's sake, Catherine. He's always this way when he's tired, Mr. Venom. Well, I'd better run along. You can call the rehearsal tomorrow morning at nine sharp. Please see that no one is late. Well, uh, taking over tomorrow, eh? Yes, Mr. Venom. I'm taking over tomorrow. With the prologue of The Black Book, the Signal Oil Company brings you another strange story by The Whistler. But now, a timely tip for you drivers. The hot summer months ahead put an extra strain on a car's cooling system, often causing motors to overheat. That's why it's a good idea to have your signal dealer inspect your radiator now. As cars grow older, radiators often become choked with rust and sludge. To take care of this, signal dealers have special rust and sludge dissolving compound that restores the radiator's cooling efficiency but can't harm the metal. If your radiator has any small leaks, your signal dealer has radiator sealer that stops them in a jiffy. And in any case, even with new cars, it's wise to add rust preventative that protects both radiator and motor from future corrosion. You see, signal service stations are much more than places to buy Signal's famous go-farther gasoline and Signal premium motor oil. Wherever you see Signal's circle sign in yellow and black, there you'll also find complete, conscientious signal service to help your car run better, look better, and last longer. And now back to the whistler. Though it all came to a climax in Philadelphia, Paul, with a ballet performance of Spectre of the Rose that made all the years of struggle worthwhile. And it's strange somehow that on your night of triumph, a woman named Catherine Valadon should walk out of your past and threaten to destroy it all. You're positive there's only one reason why she came to the company as choreographer. The reason she gave you in that London hospital room four years ago. Do you know how it feels to lie in bed with everything behind you and nothing ahead? Well, you're going to know, Paul. I'm going to show you if it takes the rest of my life. By morning, you know there's only one answer. You've got to make Wenham change his mind. I tell you, it won't work, Cecil. Either Valadon goes or I do. Well, what's happening to you, Paul? Catherine's doing such a fine job. Now, I want you to pull yourself together and start dancing. I refuse to go on tour under these conditions. Oh? Must I remind you of your contract? I don't care. Well, you'd better care. If it's violated, you'll never dance again. Never dance again. That's what she said. What? Listen, Wenham. You don't know her. She's not just trying to drive me out of the company. It's more than that. She'll stop at nothing. I don't understand you, Paul. What? I can't tell you anymore. But you've got to make a choice right now, Cecil. Valadon or me. I want you both for the good of the company. However, if you force me, well, you're big, but you can be replaced. All right. All right, replace me. There are other companies. Oh, you're talking nonsense. Furthermore, your contract is not for sale. I can hold you for two years, even if I put you to work shifting scenery. You don't even have to dance, you know. You better run along now. Valadon's waiting for you at rehearsal. It's no use, Paul. You're back in the old routine. Under Catherine's thumb again. Just like four years ago in London. Only she's worse now, isn't she? Much worse. Because she's doing it all for a purpose. Yes, and she doesn't let up for an instant. Our prima donna has finally decided to attend the rehearsal. I'm, uh, I'm sorry I'm late. I, I wasn't sure what time the this call was. The schedule is on the board. Yes, a Parisian, 10.30 a.m. sharp. Can I be clearer than that? Is the world going to fall apart if I'm two minutes late? A real artist takes pride in precision. I prefer to save it for the dance. An excellent idea. You'll need it in the new specialty I'm preparing. What are you talking about? I'm working out the choreography now. 
It's a pas de deux, especially for you, Paul. I want to have it ready by the time we go on tour. You're frantic now, not knowing what's in the back of her mind. And during the days that follow, you wonder about the special dance she's preparing. What she meant when she said it was especially for you. It becomes clear the afternoon she introduces you to Eric Ballard. A big, hulking man who'd look more at home in the wrestling ring than on a ballet stage. I meant to tell you more about Eric, Paul. He'll be an excellent supporting partner for you. Partner? Yes, well, in the new ballet I'm creating. Uh, Mr. Benham thinks it's very original. Actually, it's based on something we used to do in London. You and I. Catherine, what are you trying you to do? You remember, Paul? The one we were rehearsing the day you slipped? <laughs> I've rearranged it entirely. Eric here takes your place. You take mine. I take your place. It sounds like an exciting number to me, Mr. Cooper. Eric, why don't you go get Mr. Benham? We'll run through it for him. Sure thing, Miss Valadon. Be right back. Catherine, what is this? Why did you hire that hulking fool of... Please, Paul. He's sweet to his friend. And devoted, too. I suppose he'd do anything you tell him. Perhaps. But you needn't worry about the dance. He is very strong, Paul. Well, I won't do it, Catherine. If you think I'll fall for this crude attempt at revenge... You... Revenge? That's the most you've ever admitted. I, well, I, I don't Perhaps mean Perhaps that... I should recall that little London incident to the trade papers. Let them know that their celebrated Paul Cooper is actually the Paul Cartnell who deliberately dropped the great ballerina and made certain that Catherine Valadon would never dance again. Catherine... That's all forgotten. You wouldn't make it. You'll rehearse this number with Eric. Have it ready for the time when we want to add some variety to the program. Whatever you say, Catherine. Good. You should enjoy it, Paul. As Eric said, it will be very exciting. <laughs> The tour that follows is a nightmare with each new city a threat. You've rehearsed the new ballet with Eric and all but the spectacular bit which is to be performed on a high platform. And you never know when Catherine will decide that the time is right for her revenge. She knows you're afraid, Paul. That's all part of it, keeping you in suspense this way. From Philadelphia, the company goes to Cincinnati, then St. Louis, Chicago, and on west to Denver. You expect the crisis there, but it doesn't happen. Finally, in the last night in Denver, when there's only San Francisco left ahead, you decide you can't stand it any longer, that you must face Catherine and have it out. As you approach your dressing room, you hear her talking to someone. You step back out of sight as the door opens. Come along, Eric. We'll talk while you are packing. Are we going on ahead of the rest of the company, Miss Valadon? Yes. I have to make extra arrangements. The uh, thing we discussed, Eric, it's coming off in San Francisco. Well, I've been wondering if you changed your mind. Not in uh, the slightest. You start after them, Paul, and then stop, confused, wondering. Through the open door of Catherine's dressing room, you catch sight of a notebook on a dressing table. The famous black book that contains every move she makes, every decision, every appointment. You hurry over to it thumb through the pages before she comes back. It's all there, Paul. The hotel on Knob Hill where Catherine will be staying. Her room number, the business meeting, a list of appointments. The last one with Eric to end promptly at 11 tomorrow night. Then at the top of the next page, the thing you're looking for, final rehearsal, Cooper's specialty, Monday, 9 a.m. There's no question now, Paul. She's made up her mind. You're going to have an accident. Monday. Do you know how it feels to be through as a dancer? You're going to know, Paul. I'm going to show you if it takes the rest of my life. There's still an alternative, of course. You can let Catherine end your career or meet her on her own ground. By the time she's left on the train, you still haven't decided. It's the only thing on your mind as you stand in line at the railroad terminal, waiting to pick up your reservation. There's a worried little man ahead of you. 
Listen, I've simply got to get space on that San Francisco train. I can give you an upper on the next one. But it won't do. It won't do at all. You see, I'm meeting the steamer there, the Silver Star, sailing for Shanghai. The next train will miss it. I'm awfully sorry, sir. Perhaps if you wait around, there'll be a cancellation. Oh, I see. Thank you. It comes to you at that moment, Paul. This is perfect. This train you'd planned to take ahead of the rest of the company. The frantic little man desperate for a ticket on his way out of the country. You pick up your reservation. Walk over to the stranger pacing anxiously in the corner of the station lobby. Excuse me. Uh, you wanted to go to San Francisco? Tonight? Uh, yes, I've simply got to get on that train. So I heard. I, uh, I have a ticket here I want somebody to use. Oh? I'm a, I'm a traveling man, you see, and, uh, well, uh -huh. I... I want my boss to think that I'm on that train. Oh, but isn't that... Nothing to it. All you have to do is travel in my name. Uh, Paul Cooper. What about it? Uh, Cooper, huh? Mister, for a place on that train, I travel as Mickey Mouse. Oh, fine. Then it's a deal. Mr. Cooper. Uh, what time is your next flight for San Francisco? Oh, we have space available on our 5 o'clock flight tomorrow. Not till then? I could do almost as well by leaving by train tonight. Not quite, sir. Our plane arrives in San Francisco tomorrow night at 11. The train leaving tonight doesn't reach San Francisco until uh, a half hour after midnight, 12.30. So you save at least an hour and a half. Well, I, I guess I can use an hour and a half extra sleep as well as anybody. Uh... Send the ticket over to the Denver Hotel, please. I'll leave the money at the desk. The name is, um, uh, Jackson. An hour and a half, Paul. That's how much time you'll have. But it's enough. For you're on a schedule now, too. As exact a schedule as the one in Catherine's little black book. <laughs> You stay overnight at the Denver Hotel under the name of Jackson, then pick up your plane ticket. The next afternoon at five, you're taking off for San Francisco. It's a swift flight, uneventful. And half an hour after landing at Mills Field, you're stepping out of the elevator on the top floor of Catherine's Hotel. You wait until the elevator starts down and then hurry to the stairs. Catherine's room is actually two floors below. You glance at your watch as you knock softly on a door. 11.35. And the black book told you her appointment with Eric was to end promptly at 11. You can depend on that, Paul. Just a minute. Paul! What are you doing here at this time of night? I thought you were on the train. I am on the train, Catherine. What's the matter with you? Have you been drinking? No, Catherine. What's this all about? Why have you come here? To see you. What about? Your unfinished business, Catherine. I don't want to discuss that now. Please, go, Paul. No more discussions, eh, Catherine? The appointment's for the day over. Complete. There'll be no interruptions. What are you... Paul! Come here, Catherine. Oh, no, not oh. the telephone. Let go of me. Paul! I'll let go, Catherine, just as I did once before. But first... Stop it, Paul! Please! Put down that candlestick! Paul! As she falls to the floor, you put the heavy brass candlestick back on the table. Cross quickly to the French doors leading onto the balcony and open them wide. A moment later, you stand near the railing, high over the glittering city... Catherine's body in your arms. The little black book will tell them she was all alone. Won't it, Paul? No more appointment. The body hurtling to the street will establish the moment of her death beyond any doubt. And you can slip quietly down to the station, just in time to make an appearance when the train arrives. You lift her high up on the railing, and then... Cooper, what are you... Hack, let go of her. Put her down. Get away from me. Leave me alone. Oh. Okay, Cooper. Okay. What the devil was he trying to... Good Lord. She's dead. 
How did he ever expect to get away with it? Operator, get me the police. The Whistler will return in just a moment with a strange ending to tonight's story. Right now, however, I'd like to clear up another mystery that baffles a good many drivers. There are many brands of gasoline on the market. Some are naturally better than others. But how can you measure the quality of gasoline? Well, there's one very simple way, if you'll just keep this in mind. To give you superior performance, quicker starting, faster pickup, and smoother knock-free power, a gasoline must help your motor run more efficiently. Now, when your motor runs more efficiently, you naturally get better mileage. And mileage is something you can measure with your speedometer. That's why Signal says your speedometer is your best yardstick of gasoline quality. Check yours and you'll find it's true. In gasoline, it takes extra quality to go farther. And remember, Signal is the famous go-farther gasoline. And now, back to the Whistler. The last you remember, Paul, is the smashing blow of Eric's fist. There in Catherine Valadon's hotel room on the 12th floor. Everything's quiet now. No tension. No fear. Just soft, warm blackness. No, Paul. It doesn't seem to matter now that you killed Catherine Valadon because she forced you to choose between murder and a brilliant career. And it doesn't matter either that on this night, for the first time in all the years you've known her, she failed to follow the schedule in the little black book to the minute. You open your eyes, blinking into the glare of a white light at police headquarters. Yes, Eric Ballard is talking to a quiet-faced man in plain clothes. At first, I couldn't see how he expected to get away with it. The door unlocked and everything. I got up there and walked right in. I found him about to drop the body over the balcony rail to the street. Yeah, trying to make it look like a suicide, huh? What were you doing there, Ballard? Oh. I was keeping an appointment I had with her. You were a little late for that appointment, weren't you, Eric? Yeah. Our boy's back with us. That's what did it, you know, Eric. For the first time in Catherine's life, she didn't go by the book. What's he talking about? The notebook Miss Valadon kept her appointments in. She changed the appointment, didn't she, Eric? She changed it. You knew her better than that. That book was a religion with her. She lived by it. Shh, don't tell me she lived by it. I saw that book back in Denver. Your appointment with her was to end at 11. That's where you slipped up, Cooper. No. No, I didn't slip up. I was too careful. I tell you, I saw it. That's not what I'm talking about. What do you mean? Take a look at your watch, Cooper. Huh. My watch? Yeah. You forgot to set it back. Huh? You see, what? Cooper, you're still on Mountain Standard Time. Let that whistle be your signal for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler, each Monday at 8. Brought to you by the Signal Oil Company, marketers of Signal gasoline and motor oil and fine quality automotive accessories. Signal has asked me to remind you to get the most driving pleasure, drive at sensible speeds, be courteous, and obey traffic regulations. It may save a life, possibly your own. <laughs> Featured in tonight's story were Jeanette Nolan and David Ellis. The Whistler was produced by George W. Allen with music by Wilbur Hatch, story by William Engvik, and was transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. This is Marvin Miller speaking for the Signal Oil Company. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.